All right, guys, so we're going to read the last chapter of Speak, the fourth marking period. The PTA has started a petition to get rid of the Hornets as our school mascot. It was the cheer that got them. They heard it at the last basketball game. We are the Hornets, the horny, horny Hornets. Everywhere we go, oh, people want to know who we are. So we tell them we are the Hornets, the horny, horny Hornets, and on and on and on. The wiggles and the shakes that accompany this cheer freaked out the Meriwether PTA. Freaked out PTAs all over the city when the horny hornet cheer was televised. The TV sports guy thought the song was cute. So he did a segment showing the hornet hustle when the cheerleaders shaking their stingers and the crowd bumping and grinding with their horny hornet heinies. The student council started a counter petition. The honor society wore it, wrote it. It described the psychological harm we all have suffered from this year's lack of identity. It pleads for consistency, stability. It's pretty good. We, the students of Meriwether High, have become proud of our hornet selves. We are tenacious, singing, clever. We are the hive, a community of students. Don't ta take away our hornetum. We are hornets. It wouldn't be a real issue until football Paul season starts up again. Our baseball team is always stinks. Spring is on the way. The winter rats, rest, the winter rats, rusty brown $700 cars that everyone senses to drive from November until April are rolling back into storage. The snow is melting for good and the pretty baby shiny cars glitter in the senior parking lot. There are other signs of spring. Front lawns cough up the shovels and mittens that were gobbled by snowdrifts in January. My mother moved the winter coats up to the attic. Dad's been mumbling about the storm windows, but hasn't taken them down. From the bus, I saw a farmer walking his field, waiting for the mud to tell him where to plant. April Fool's Day is when most seniors get their acceptance or rejection letters from college. Thumbs up, thumbs down. It's a sick piece of timing. Tensions are running high. Kids drink pink stomach drinks from the bottle. David Petrowski, my lab partner, is writing a database program to track who got in where. He wants to analyze which advanced placement classes the seniors took, their standardized test scores, extracurriculars, and GPAs to figure out what he needs to get into Harvard. I've been going to most of my classes. Good girl, Melly. Roll over, Melly. Sit, Melly. No one's ever patted me on the head, though. I passed an algebra test. I passed an English test. I passed a biology test. Well, hallelujah. It's all so profoundly stupid. Maybe this is why kids join clubs, to give them something to think about during class. Andy Beast joined the International Club. He had figured him, I hadn't figured him for a deep interest in Greek cooking or French museums. He has abandoned the Martha, the Martha table and hangs out and onto Rachel Rochelle and Greta Ingrid and all the other resident aliens. Rachel flutters her purple eyelashes at him while she, well, like he's some kind of uber dude. You'd think she had more sense. Easter came and went without much notice. I think it's caught my mother by surprise. She doesn't like Easter because the date keeps shifting and it's not a shopping holiday. When I was a kid, mom used to hide colored eggs for me all around the house. The last egg was inside a big basket of chocolate rabbits and a yellow marshmallow chips. Before my grandparents died, they would take me to church and I would wear stiff dresses with itchy lace. This year we celebrated by eating lamb chops. I made hard-boiled eggs for lunch and drew little faces on them with a black pen. Dad complained about how much yard work has to be done. Mom didn't say much. I said less. In heaven, my grandparents frowned. I sort of wish we had gone to church. Some of the Easter songs are pretty. It is the last day of spring break. My house is shrinking and I feel like Alice in Wonderland. Afraid that my head might burst through the roof. I head for the mall. I have 10 bucks in my pocket. What to spend it on? French fries? $10 worth of French fries? ultimate fantasy. If Alice in Wonderland were written today, I bet she'd have a supersized order of fries that said, eat me instead of a small cake. On the other hand, we're rushing towards summer, which means shorts and t-shirts and maybe even bathing suit now and then. I walk past the deep fryers. Now that spring has passed, the fall fashions are in the store windows. I keep waiting for the year when fashions catch up with the seasons. A couple of stores have performance artists hanging at the front door. One guy keeps flying a stupid loop-the-loop -loop airplane. A plastic-faced woman keeps tying and retying a shawl. Now, or no, now it's a skirt. Now it's a halter top. Now it's a headscarf. People avoid looking at her as if they aren't sure if they should be able 
if they should applaud or tip her. Uh, I feel bad for her. I wonder what her grades were in high school. I want to give her a tip. Only it would be rude to ask if she has changed for a 10. I ride the escalator down to the central fountain where today's entertainment is face painting. The line is long and loud, six-year-olds and their mothers. A little girl walks past me. She's a tiger. She's crying about ice cream and she wipes her tears. Her tiger paint smears and her mom yells at her. What a zoo. I turn, Ivy is sitting on the edge of the fountain, a giant sketchbook balanced on her knees. She nods towards the line of, of whiners and the face painters furiously coloring stripes, spots, and whiskers. I feel bad for them, I said. What are you drawing? Ivy moves so, so I can sit next to her and hands me the sketchbook. She's drawing the kids' faces. Half of them is plain and sad and the other half is plastered with thick clown makeup that is fake happy. She hasn't painted any tigers or leopards. The last time I was here, they were doing clown faces. No such luck today, Ivy explains. Looks good though, I say. It's kind of spooky. Not creepy, but unexpected. I hand back the sketchbook. Ivy pokes her pencil into her bun. Good, that's what I was trying for. That turkey bone thing you did was creepy, too. Creepy in a good way. Good creepy. It's been months and I'm still thinking about it. What am I supposed to say now? I bite my lip, then release it. I pull a roll of lifesavers from my pocket. One a piece, she takes one, I take three, and we suck in silence for a moment. How's the trees coming? She asks. I groan. Stinks. It was a mistake to sign up for art. I couldn't see myself taking wood shop. You're better than you think you are, Ivy says. She opens an empty page in the sketchbook. I don't know why you keep using a linoleum block. If I were you, I'd just let it out. Draw. Here, try a tree. We sit back trading pencils. I draw a tree and Ivy adds a branch. I extend the branch, but it's too long and spindly. I try to erase it, but Ivy stops me. It's fine the way it is. It just needs some leaves. Layer the leaves and make them slightly different sizes and it'll look great. And you have, you have a great start there. And she's right. The last unit of the year in biology is genetics. It's impossible to listen to Mrs. Keene. Her voice sounds like a cold engine that won't turn over. The lecture starts with some great priest named Greg who studied vegetables and ends up in an argument about blue eyes. I think I've missed something. How did we leap from veggies to eye colors? I'll copy David's notes. I flip ahead in the textbook. There's an interesting chapter about acid rain. Nothing about sex. We aren't scheduled to learn about that until 11th grade. David draws a chart in his notebook. I snap my pencil point and walk to the front of the room to sharpen it. I figure the walk will do me good. Mrs. Keene sputters on. We get half of our genes from our mother and half from our father. I thought my genes came from efforts. Ha <laughs> ha, biology joke. Mom says I take after my dad's side of the family. They're mostly cops and insurance salesmen who bet on football games and smoke disgusting cigars. Dad says I take after mom's side of the family. There are farmers who grow rocks and poison ivy. They don't say much. Visit dentist or read. When I was a little kid, I used to pretend I was a princess who had been adopted when my kingdom was overrun by bad guys. Any day, my real parents, Mr. King and Mrs. Queen, would send the royal limo to pick me up. I just about had a seven-year-old heart attack when my dad took a limo to the airport for the first time. I thought they had really come to take me away, and I didn't want to go. Dad took taxis after that. I look out the window. No limos, no chariots, no carriages. Now, when I really want to leave, no one will give me a ride. I sketch a willow tree drooping into the water. I won't show it to Mr. Freeman. This one's for the closet, for my closet. I've been taping some of my drawings on the walls. Any more classes as boring as this one and I'll be ready to move back in there full time. My leaves are good, natural. The trick is to make them different sizes and then crowd them on top of each other. Ivy was right. Mrs. Keene writes dominant slash recessive on the board. I look at David's notes. He's drawing a family tree. David got his hair gene from his dad and his eyes gene from his mom. I draw a family tree, a family stump. There aren't many of us. I can barely remember their names. Um, Uncle Jim, Uncle Thomas, Aunt Mary, Aunt Kathy. There's another aunt. She's very recessive. She recessed herself all the way to Peru. I think I have her eyes. I got my I don't want to know about it gene from my dad and I'll think about it tomorrow gene from my mom. Mrs. Keene says, we'll have a quiz the next day. I wish I had paid attention during class. I wish I were adopted. I wish David would quit sighing when I asked to copy his notes. 
10 more lies they tell you in high school. One, you will use algebra in your adult lives. Two, driving to school is a privilege that can be taken away. Three, students must stay on campus for lunch. Four, the new test books will arrive any day now. Five, college cares more about your, your SAT scores. Six, we are enforcing the dress code. Seven, we will figure out how to turn off the heat soon. Eight, your bus drivers are highly trained professionals. Nine, there is nothing wrong with summer school. And 10, we want to hear what you have to say. Rachel has lost her mind. She has flipped. She went to the movies with Andy Beast and her exchange students, and now she follows after him, panting like a Bichon Frise. Her, she wears her buddy Greta Ingrid's draped around his neck like a white scarf. When he spits, I bet Rachel catches it in a cup and saves it. Rachel and some other twit nanter about the movie date before Mr. Stepman's class starts class. I want to puke. Rachel is just Andy this and Andy that. Could she be more could she be more obvious? I close or yeah, obvious. I close my ears to her stupid asthmatic laugh and work on my homework that was due yesterday. It is unusually it is usually easy to do homework in class because Mr. Stepman's voice creates a gentle white noise sound barrier. I can't do it today. I can't escape the arguments circling my head. Why worry about Rachel? He'll hurt her. He, he um, Had she had done a single decent thing for me the whole year, she was my best friend through middle school. That counts for something. No, she's a witch and a traitor. She didn't see what happened. Let her lust after the beast. I hope he breaks her heart. What if he breaks something else? When class is over, I slide into the middle of the pack, pushing out the door before Mr. Stepman can bust me for my homework. Rachel shoves past me where Greta and Ingrid and a short kid from Belgium are waiting. I tail them, always keeping two bodies between us like the detectives on television. They're on their way to a foreign lang uh, language wing. That's no surprise. The foreign kids are always there, like they need to breathe air scented with their native language a couple times a day or they'll choke to death on too much American. Andy B. swoops in over their heads, folds his wings, and sets himself between uh, the girls as they start up the stairs. He tries to kiss in uh, Greta Ingrid's cheek, but she turns away. He kisses Rachel's cheek, and she giggles. He does not kiss the, the cheek of the short Belgian. The Belgian and the Swede wave chow at the office of the foreign language department. Rumor has it that there is an espresso maker in there. A friendly momentum, momentum keeps Rachel and Andy walking all the way to the end of the hall. I face the corner and pretend to study algebra. I figure that's enough to make me unrecognizable. They sit on the floor, Rachel in full lotus. Andy steals Rachel's notebook. She whines like a baby and throws herself across his lap to get it back. I shiver with goosebumps. He tosses the notebook from one hand to another, always keeping it out of her reach. And then he says something to her. I can't hear it. The hallway sounds like a packed football stadium. His lips move poison and she smiles and then she kisses him wet, not a Girl Scout kiss. He gives her the notebook, his lips or his lips move, lava spills out of my ears. She's not any part of the pretend Rochelle sh chick. I can't, I can only see the third grade Rachel who liked barbecue potato chips and braided pink embroidery thread in my hair that I wore for months until my mom made me cut it out. I rest my forehead against the prickly secco. The best place to figure out this out is in my closet, my throne room, my foster home. I want to shower. Maybe I should tell Greta Ingrid, my Swedish isn't good enough. I could talk to Rachel. Yeah, right. I could say I've heard bad things about Andy. It would only make him more attractive. I could maybe tell her what happened. As if she'd listen. What if she told Andy? What would he do? There isn't much room for pacing. I took two steps, turn, two steps back. I bang my shin against my chair. Stupid room, what a dumb idea. Sitting in a closet like this, I flop into the chair and it whooshes out old janitor smells. Feet, beef jerky, shirts left in the washer too long. The turkey bone sculpture gives off a faint rotting odor. Three baby food jars of potpourri don't make a dent in the sink. Maybe there's a dead rat decomposing in the wall, right near the hot air event. Maya Angelou watches me two fingers on the side of her face. It's an intelligent pose. Maya wants me to tell Rachel. I take off my sweatshirt. My t-shirt sticks to me. It's They still have the heat running full blast, even though it's warm enough to crack open the windows. That's what I need, a window. As much as I complain about winter, cold air is easier to breathe. Slipping, 
uh, slipping like silver mercury down in my lungs and out again. April is humid with slush evaporating and rain drizzle or dra rain drizzling, a warm moldy washcloth of a month. The edges of my pictures curl in the damp. There's been some progress in the whole tree project, I guess. I, Picasso, have gone through different phases. There was a confused period where I wasn't sure what the assignment really was, the spaz period when I couldn't draw a tree to save my life, the dead period when all of my trees looked like they had been through a forest fire or a blight. I'm getting better. I don't know what to call this phase yet. All of my drawings make the closet seem smaller. Maybe I should bribe a janitor to haul all this stuff to my house, make my bedroom more like this, more like home. Maya taps me on the shoulder. I'm not listening. I know, I know. I don't want to hear it. I need to do something about Rachel, something for her. Maya tells me without saying anything. I stall. Rachel will hate me. She already hates me. She won't listen. I have to try. I groan and rip out a paper of notebook, a piece of notebook paper. I write her a note, a left-handed note, so she won't know it's from me. Andy Evans will use you. He is not what he pretends to be. I heard he attacked a ninth grader. Be very, very careful. A friend. P.S. Tell Greta Ingrid too. She didn't tell this. I didn't want the Swedish supermodel on my conscience either. Mr. Freeman is a jerk. Instead of leaving me to find my muse, a real quote, I swear. He lands in the stool next to me and starts criticizing. What's wrong with my tree? He overflows with words describing how bad it sucks. It's stiff, unnatural, doesn't flow. It's an insult to trees everywhere. I agree. My trees are hopeless. It is an art. It's an excuse not to take sewing class. I don't belong in Mr. Freeman's room any more than I belong in the Martha's or the little girl pink bedroom. This is where the real artists belong, like Ivy. I carry the linoleum box back to the garbage can and throw, throw it in hard enough to make everyone look at me. Ivy frowns through her wire sculpture. I sit back down and lay my head on the table. Mr. Freeman retrieves the block from the garbage. He brings back the Kleenex box too. How could he tell I was crying? Mr. Freeman, you are getting better at this, but it's not good enough. This looks like a tree, but it's an average, ordinary, everyday, boring tree. Breathe life into it. Make a bend. Trees are flexible so they don't snap. Scar it. Give it a twisted branch. Trees, perfect trees don't exist. Nothing is perfect. Flaws are interesting. Be the tree. He has this ice cream voice like a kindergarten teacher. If he thinks I can do it, then I'll try one more time. My fingers tip tip to over to the linoleum knife. Mr. Freeman pats my shoulder once, then turns to make someone else miserable. I wait until he isn't watching, and then I carve life into the fat linoleum, flat linoleum square. Maybe I could carve off all the linoleum and call it empty block. If a famous person did did that, it probably would be really popular and sell for a fortune. If I did it, I'd flunk. Be the tree. What kind of advice is that? Mr. Freeman has been hanging out with too many new age weirdos. I was a tree in the second grade play because I made a bad sheep. I stood there with my arms outstretched for branches and my head drooping in the breeze. It gave me sore arms. I doubt trees are ever told to be the screwed up ninth grader. David Petrowski's lawyer made a meeting with Mr. Neck and some kind of teacher lawyer. Guess who won? I bet David could skip class for the rest of the year if he wanted and still get an A, which he would never do. But you better believe that whenever David raises his hand, Mr. Neck lets him talk as much as he wants. David, quiet David, is full of long, drawn-out, rambling opinions about social studies. The rest of the class is grateful. We bow to the almighty David who keeps the neck off our backs. Unfortunately, Mr. Neck still gives tests, and most of us fail them. Mr. Neck makes an announcement. Anyone who is flunking can write an extra credit report on cultural influence at the turn of the century. He skipped the Industrial Revolution so he could drag our class past the, 1900, past the year 1900. He does not want all of us in summer school. I don't want to see him in summer school either. I write about the suffragettes. Before the suffragettes came along, women are treated like dogs. Women could not vote. Women could not own property. Women were not allowed in many schools. They were dolls with no thoughts or opinions or voices of their own. Then suffragettes marched in full of loud in-your-face ideas. They got arrested and thrown in jail, but nothing shut them up. They fought and fought until they earned rights that they should have had all along. I write the best report ever. 
Anything I copied from a book, I put in quotes or footnotes, feet note. I use the book's magazine articles and a videotape. I'm looking for an old suffragette in the nursing home, but they're probably all dead. I even hand it in on time. Mr. Neck scowls. He looks down on me and says, to get credit for the report, you have to deliver it orally tomorrow at the beginning of class. Me. There's no way I'm reading my suffragette report in the front of class. It wasn't part of the original assignment. Mr. Neck changed it at the very last second because he wants to flunk me or he hates me or something. But I've written a really good report and I'm not going to let an idiot teacher jerk me around like this. I asked David Petrosky for his advice. We come up with a plan. I get to class early when Mr. Neck is still in the lounge. I write what I need to on the board and cover the words with a suffragette poster sign. My box from the coffee shop is on the floor. Copy shop is on the floor. Mr. Neck walks in. He grumbles that I can go first. I stand a suffragette tall and calm. It is a lie. My insides feel like I'm caught in a tornado. My toes curl inside my sneakers trying to grip the floor so I won't get uh, stuck out the, sucked out the window. Mr. Neck nods at me. I pick up my report as if I'm going to read it out loud. I stand there, papers trembling as if a breeze is blowing through the closed door. I turn around and rip my poster off the blackboard. The suffragettes fought for the right to speak. They were attacked, arrested, and thrown in jail for daring to do what they wanted. Like they were, I am willing to stand up for what I believe. No one should be forced to give speeches. I choose to stay silent. The class reads slowly, some of them moving their lips. Mr. Neck turns around to see what everyone's staring at. I nod to David. He joins me at the front of the room and I hand him my box. David, Melinda has to deliver her report to the class as part of her assignment. She made copies for everyone to read. He passes out the copies. They cost me $6.72 at the office supply store. I was going to make a cover page and color it, but I haven't gotten that much allowance recently, so I have just put a title at the top of the fresh page. My plan is to stand in the front of the class for the five minutes I was given for my presentation. The suffragettes must have planned out in time their protests, too. Mr. Neck has other plans. He gives me ID and escorts me to the authorities. I forget about how suffragettes were hauled off to jail. Duh. I go on a tour to the guidance office guidance counselor's office, principal principals, and wind up in Miss, which is ISS. I am back to a discipline problem again. I need a lawyer. I show up every day this semester, sat my butt in every class, did some homework, and didn't cheat on a test. And I get slammed in Miss. There's no way they can punish me for not speaking. It isn't fair. What, what do they know about me? What do they know about the inside of my head? Flashes of lightning, children crying, caught in an avalanche, pinned by worry, squirming under the weight of doubt, guilt, fear. The walls of mist are still white. Andy Beast isn't, isn't here. Thank God for small favors. A boy in a lime colored hair who looks like he's been channeling uh, alien species dozes. Two goths in black velvet dresses and artfully torn pantyhose trade Mona Lisa smiles. They cut school to stand in line for killer concert tickets. This is a small price to pay for row 10, seats 21 and 22. I simmer. Lawyers on TV always tell their clients not to say anything. The cops say that thing. Anything that you say will be used against you. Self-incrimination. I looked it up. Free point vocabulary word. So why does everyone make such a big, a hairy deal about me not talking? Maybe so... Maybe I don't want to incriminate myself. Maybe I don't like the sound of my voice. Maybe I don't have anything to say. The boy in the lime-colored hair wakes up um, when he falls out of his chair. The goth girl's whiny. Mr. Neck peeks, uh, picks his nose when he thinks we aren't looking. I need a lawyer. David Petrosky sends me a note in social studies, typed. He thinks it's horrible that my parents didn't videotape Mr. Neck's class or stick up for me the way he his folks did. It feels so good to have someone feel sorry for me. And I don't mention that my parents don't know what happens. They'll figure out what happens soon enough at the next meeting with the guidance counselor. I think David should be a judge. His latest career goal is to be a quantum physics genius. I don't know what that means, but he says his father is furious. His dad is right. David was made for law. Deadly calm, turbocharged brain, and a good eye for weakness. He stops by my locker and I tell him Mr. Neck gave me D for the suffragette report. He has a point. It was a great report. You read it. I wrote a bibliography and I didn't copy from the encyclopedia. It was the best report ever. It's not my fault Mr. Neck doesn't get performance art. David pauses to offer me a stick of gum. It's a delaying tactic, the kind that juries love.
But you got it wrong. The suffragettes weren't all about speaking up, screaming for their rights. You can't speak up for your right to be silent. That's letting the bad guys win. If the suffragettes did that, women wouldn't be able to vote yet. I blow a bubble in his face. He folds the gum wrappers into tiny triangles. Don't get me wrong. I think what you did was kind of cool and getting stuck in mess wasn't fair. But don't expect to make a difference unless you speak up for yourself. Do you lecture all of your friends like this? Only the ones I like. We both chew on this for a minute. The bell rings and I keep looking in my locker for a book I already know isn't there. David checks his watch a hundred times. I hear principal, principal, bellow. Let's move it, people. David, maybe I'll call you. Maybe I won't answer. Chew, chew, blow, bubble, pop. Maybe I will. Is he asking me out? I don't think so. But he kind of is. I guess I'll answer if he calls. But if he touches me, I'll explode. So a date is out of the question. No touching. I stay after school a week to work on, I stay after school to work on tree sketches. Mr. Freeman helps me for a while. He gives me a roll of brown paper and a piece of white chalk and shows me how to draw trees in three swooping lines. He doesn't care how many mistakes I make, just one, two, three, like a waltz, he says, over and over. I use up a mile of paper, but he doesn't care. There may be a root of his... This may be the root of his budget problem with the school board. God crackles over the intercom and tells Mr. Freeman he's late for faculty meeting. Mr. Freeman says the kind of words you don't usually hear from teachers. He gives me a new piece of chalk and tells me to draw roots. He can't give a decent, you can't grow a decent tree without roots. The art, excuse me, the art room is one of the places I feel safe. I hum and don't worry about looking stupid. Roots, ugh. But I try. One, two, three. One, two, three. I don't worry about the next day or minute. One, two, three. Someone flicks the lights off. My head snaps up. It is there. Andy Beast. Little rabbit heart leaps out of my chest and scampers across the paper, leaving bloody footprints on the roots. He turns the light back on. I smell him. We have to find out where he gets the clone. I think it's called fear. This is turning into one of those repeating nightmares where you keep falling but never hit the floor, only I feel I just smacked into the ground 100 miles an hour. It. You seen Rochelle? Rochelle Bruin? I sit completely still. Maybe I can blend in with the mental table, with the metal tables and crumbling clay pots. He walks towards me, long, slow strides. The smell chokes me, and I shiver. She's supposed to meet me, but I can't find her anywhere. You know who she is? It sits on my table. Its leg smears my, ch my chalk drawing, blurring the roots into a mossy fog. Hello, anyone home? Are you deaf? It stares at my face. I crush my jaws together so hard my teeth crumble to dust. I'm a deer frozen in headlights of a tractor trailer. Is he going to hurt me again? He couldn't, not in school. Could he? Why can't I scream? Say something. Do anything. Why am I so afraid? Andy, I've been waiting outside. Rachel sweeps into the room wearing an artsy fartsy gypsy scarf skirt and necklace of an eye size mirrors. She pouts and Andy leaps off the table, ripping my paper, scattering bits of chalk. Ivy walks through the door, bumping Rachel accidentally. She hesitates. She has to feel what something's going on. Then she takes her sculpture off of the shelf and sits at the table next to me. Rachel looks at me, but she doesn't say anything. She must have gotten my note. I mailed it over a week ago. I stand up. Rachel gives off a half wave and says, chill. And Andy puts his arm around her waist and pulls her close to his body as they float out the door. Ivy's talking to me, but it takes a, a while before I can hear her. What a jerk, she says. She pinches the clay. I can't believe she's going out with him. Can you? It's like I don't know her anymore, and he's trouble. She slaps a hunk of clay on the table. Believe me, the creep is trouble with a capital it, or with a capital T. I'd love to stay and chat, but my feet won't let me. I walk home instead of taking the bus. I unlock the front door, walk straight up to the room, across the rug, and into my closet without even taking off my backpack. When I close the closet door behind me, I bury my face into the clothes on the left side of the rack, clothes that haven't fit for years. I stuff my mouth with old fabric and scream until there's no sounds left under my skin. It is the time for a mental health day. I need a day in pajamas, eating ice cream from the carton, painting my toenails, enjoying trash TV. You have to plan ahead for mental health days. I've learned this from the conversation my mother had with her friend Kim. Mom always starts acting sick 48 hours ahead of time. 
She and Kim take mental health days together. They buy shoes and go to the movies. Cutting edge adult delinquency. What is the world coming to? I don't eat my dinner or dessert, and I cough so much during the news, my dad tells me to go take cough medicine. In the morning, I smear mascara under my eyes so it looks like I haven't slept at all. Mom takes my temperature. Turns out I have a fever. Surprises even me. Her hand is cold, and I limped on my forehead. The words tumble out before I can stop them. I don't feel well. Mom pats my back. You must be sick. You're talking. Even if she can hear how bitchy that sounds, she clears her throat and tries again. I'm sorry. It's nice to hear your voice. Go back to bed, and I'll bring you a tray before I leave. Do you want some ginger ale? I nod. My fever is 102.2. Sounds like a radio station. Mom calls to remind me to drink lots of fluids. I say thank you, even though it hurts my throat. It's nice for her to call me. She promises to bring home popsicles. I hang up and snuggle into my couch nest with the remote. Click, click, click. If my life were a TV show, what would it be? If it were an after-school special, would I speak in front of the auditorium of my peers on how not to lose your virginity, or why seniors should be locked up, or my summer vacation, a drunken party, lies, and rape? Was I raped? Oprah, let's explore that. You said no. He covered your mouth with his hand. You were 13 years old, and it doesn't matter that you were drunk, honey. You were raped. What a horrible, horrible thing for you to live through. Didn't you ever think of telling anyone? Why can't you can't keep this inside forever? Can somebody get her a tissue? Sally Jesse, I want this boy held responsible. He is to blame for this attack. You know it was an attack, don't you? It's not your fault. You, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. It's not your fault. That this boy isn't was an animal. Jerry, was it love? No. Was it lust? Was it tenderness, sweetness? The first time they talk about it in magazines? No, 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 no. Speak up, Matilda. Ah, Melinda, I can't hear you. My head is killing me. My throat is killing me. My stomach bubbles with toxic waste. I just want to sleep. A coma would be nice, or amnesia. Anything just to get rid of this. These thoughts, the whispers in my head, in my mind. Did he rape my head too? My, I take two Tylenol and eat a bowl of pudding. Then I watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and fall asleep. A trip to the neighborhood of make-believe would be nice. Maybe I could stay with Daniel Striped Tiger in his treehouse. May is finally here and it has stopped raining. Good thing too. The mayor of Sarah Chris was about to put a call for a guy named Noah. A son appears butter yellow and so warm it coaxes tulips out of their crusty uh, mud out of the crusty mud. A miracle. Our yard is a mess. All of our neighbors have these great magazine cover yards with flowers that match their shutters and expensive white rocks that border fresh mounds of mulch. Ours has green bushes that just about cover the front windows and lots of dead leaves. Mom is already gone. Saturday is the biggest selling day of the week at efforts. Dad snores upstairs. I put on old jeans and unearth a rake from the back of the garage. I start on the leaves, suffocating the bushes. I bet dad hasn't cleared them out for years. They look harmless and dry on top, but under the top, they're wet and slimy. White mold snakes from one leaf to the next. The leaves stick together like flopping pages of a decomposing book. I rake a mountain into the front yard, and there's still more, like the earth pukes up leaf gunks when I'm not looking. I have to fight the bushes. They snag the tines of the rake and hold them. They don't like me cleaning up all of that rot. It takes an hour. Maybe the rake scrapes its mental fingernails along damp brown dirt. I get down on my knees to reach behind and drag out the last leaves. Mrs. King would be proud of me, I observe. Worms caught in the sun squirm for cover. Pale green shoots of something alive that's been struggling under the leaves. Um, as I watch, they straighten to face the sun. I swear I see them grow. The garage door opens and dad backs up the Jeep. He stops in the driveway when he sees me. He turns up the engine and gets out. I stand up, brushing the dirt off my jeans. My palms are blistered and my arms are already sore from the raking. I can't tell if he's angry or not. Maybe he likes the front of the house looking like crap. It's a lot of work. I'll get some leaf bags off the store. We both stand there with our arms crossed, staring at the little baby plants trying to grow in the shade of the house eating bushes. The sun goes behind a cloud and I shiver. 
I should have worn a sweatshirt. The wind rustles dead leaves still clinging to the oak branches by the street. All that I can think of is the rest of the leaves are going to drop and I'll have to keep breaking. Looks a lot better. Cleaned out like that, I mean. The wind blows again. The trees tremble. The leaves tremble. I suppose I could trim back the bushes, of course. Then you'd see the shutters and they need paint. And if I paint the shutters, then I'll have to then I have to paint all the shutters and the trim needs work and the front door. Me. Tree. Hush, rustle, ch 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 hush. The dad turns to listen to the tree. I'm not sure what to do. And that tree is sick. See how the branches on the left don't have any buds? I should have called someone to take a look at it. I don't want it crashing into your room during a storm. Thanks, dad. Like, I'm not already having a hard time sleeping. Worry number 64, flying tree limbs. I shouldn't have raked anything. Look at what I've started. I shouldn't have tried something new. I should have stayed in the house, watched cartoons and a double-sized bowl of Cheerios. Should have stayed in my room and stayed in my house. Dad, I guess I'm going to the hardware store. Want to come? The hardware store, seven acres of unshaven men and bright-eyed women in search of the perfect screwdriver, weed killer, volcanic gas grills, noise, lights, kids running down the aisles with hatchets and axes and saw blades, people fighting about the right color to paint the bathroom. No, thank you. I shake my head. I pick up the rake and start making the dead leaf pile neater. A blister pops and stains the rake handle like a tear. Dad nods and walks to the jeep, kings jingling on his fingers. The mockingbird lands on a low oak branch and scalds me. I rake the leads out of my throat. Can you buy some seeds, flower seeds? My gym teacher, Mrs. Connors, teaches us about playing tennis. Tennis is the only sport that comes close to not being a total waste of time. Basketball would be great if uh, if all you had to do was shoot foul shots, but most of the time you were on court with nine other people bumping and shoving and running way too much. Tennis is more civilized. Only two people have to play, unless you play doubles, which I would never do. The rules are simple. You get to catch your breath every few minutes, and you can work on your tan. I actually learned a couple of summers ago when my parents had a trial membership at the fitness club. Mom signed me up for lessons when I played with dad a few times before they figured their monthly dues were too expensive. Since I'm not a total spaz with the racket, Mrs. Connors pairs me off with jock goddess Nicole to demonstrate the, the game to the rest of the class. I serve first a nice shot with a little speed on it. Nicole hits it right back to me with a great backhand. We volley a bit back and forth. Then Mrs. Connor blows her whistles to stop, explaining the retarded scoring system in tennis where the numbers don't make sense and love doesn't count for anything. Nicole serves next. She aces it. A perfect serve at about 90 miles an hour that kisses the court just inside the line, the line before I can move. Mrs. Connor tells Nicole she is awesome, and Nicole smiles. I do not smile. I'm ready for her second serve, and I hit it right back down her throat. Mrs. Connor says something nice to me, and Nicole adjusts the strings on her racket. My serve. I bounce the ball a few times, and Nicole bounces on the balls of her feet. She isn't fooling around anymore. Her pride's at stake. Her womanhood. It is not about, uh, she's not about to beat, she's not about to be beat by some weirdo, hush, quiet delinquent who used to be her friend. Mrs. Connor tells me to hit the ball. I slam into the ball, sending it right into Nicole's mouth, grinning behind her custom purple mouth guard. She twists it out of the way. Mrs. Carter's fault giggles from the class. A foot fault. Wrong foot forward, toe over the line. I get a second chance. Another civilized aspect of tennis. I bounce the yellow ball, two, one, two, three, up in the air, like releasing a bird or an apple, then arcing my arm, rotating my shoulder, and bringing down the power and the the anger and don't forget my, to aim. The racket takes on a life of its own, a bolt of energy. It crashes down on the ball, uh, bulleting it over the net. The ball explodes on the court, leaving a crater before Nicole, Nicole can blink. It blows past her and hits the fence so hard it rattles. No one laughs. No fault. I scored a point. Nicole wins eventually, but not by much. Everyone else whines about their blisters, and I have calluses on my hands from the artwork. I'm tough enough to play and strong enough to win. Maybe I can get dad to practice with me a few times. It would be the only glory of really sucky year I could, I could be at something. The yearbooks have arrived and everyone seems to understand this ritual but me. 
you hunt down every person who looks vaguely familiar to get them to write in your yearbook that the two of you are best friends and you'll never forget each other and remember class fill in the blank and have a great summer. Uh, stay sweet. I watched some kids ask the cafeteria ladies to sign their book. What do they write? Hope your chicken patties never bleed or maybe may your jello always wiggle. Your cheerleader, the cheerleaders have obtained some sort of special exemption to roam the halls with packs of pins in hand to seek out autographs from staff and students. I catch a whiff of competitive juices when they float past me. They are counting signatures. The appearance of the yearbook clears up another high school mystery. Why all the popular girls put up with the disgusting habits of Ton Ryder? He's a pig, a greasy, sleazy, foul-mouthed, unwashed. He's a great addition to the state uh, college fraternity. But the popular kids kissed up to him all year. Why? Tom Ryder is the yearbook photographer. Flip through the pages to see who, who is in his favor. Be nice to Todd and he'll take pictures of you that you should be a modeling agency calling your house any day now. Snub Todd and you'll look like a trailer park refugee having a bad hair day. If I ran a high school, I would include st stuff like this on the first uh, day indoctrination. I had understood the path. I hadn't understood the power of Todd. He snapped one picture of me walking away from the camera wearing my doopy winter coat and my, sh my shoulders up to my ears. I will not be buying a yearbook. Hair woman got a buzz cut. Her hair was a half an inch long and a new crop of head fur, short and spiky. It's black, not orange at all. And she got new glasses, purple rimmed bifocals that hang from a beaded chain. I don't know what's caused this. Has she fallen in love? Did she get a divorce, move out of her parents' basement? You never think about teachers having parents, but they must. Some kids say she did it to confuse us while we were working on our final essays. I'm not sure. You have a choice. You can write about symbolism in the comics or how story changed my life. I think something else is going on. I'm thinking she found a good shrink. Or maybe she published a novel and she's been writing since the earth cooled. I wonder if she's been teaching summer, if she'll be teaching summer school. Ivy is sitting at my um, art table with four uncapped color markers sticking out of her bun. I stand up, she turns her head, and, and bingo, I've got the rainbow on my shirt. She apologizes a hundred million times. It was, if it were anyone else, I would have figured they did it on purpose. But Ivy and me sort of have been friendly the last few weeks. I don't think she's been trying. I don't think she was trying to be mean. Mr. Freeman lets me go to the bathroom where I scrub where I try to scrub the stains. I must look like a dog chasing its tail, twisting and twirling, trying to see the stains on the back of the mirror. The door swings open. It's Ivy, and I raise my hand as she opens her mouth. Don't say it anymore. I know you're sorry. It was an accident. She points to the pen sticking on her bun. I put the caps on. Mr. Freeman made me, and then he sent me in here to see how you were doing. He's worried about me. He wants to make sure you're not pulling a disappearing act, or you don't pull a disappearing act. You've been known to wander off. Not in the middle of class. There's a first time for everything. Go in the stall and I'll hand over your shirt. You can't wash it while you're wearing it. I think Principal Principal should have his office in the restroom. Maybe then he'd hire someone to keep it clean or an armed guard to stop people from plunging up the toilet and smoking and writing on walls. Who's Alexandra? I ask. I don't know any Alexandras. Ivy's voice says above the rush of the water in the sink. There might be an Alexandra in 10th grade. Why? According to this, she's pissed off a whole bunch of people. One person wrote in huge letters that she's a whore, and all of the others added little details. She slept with a guy. She slept with that guy. She slept with those guys all the time. She's a 10th grader. She sure gets around. Ivy doesn't answer. I peer through the cracks between the door and the wall. She opens the soap container and dips my shirt in it. Then she scrubs the stains. I shiver. I'm standing at a bra. Not a terribly clean bra, and it's freezing in here. Ivy holds my shirt up to the light and frowns and scrubs some more. I want to take a deep breath, but it smells too bad. Remember what you said about Andy Evans being big trouble? Yeah. Why did you say that? She wrenches the shirt, the soap from my shirt. He has such a reputation. He, he's only after one thing, and if you believe the rumors, he'll get it no matter what. She wrings the water out of the shirt, and the sound of the dripping water echoes off the tiles. Rachel's going out with him, I say. I know. Just to add it to the loss of stupid things she's done this year, the list of stupid things she's done this year, what does she say about him? We don't really talk, I say. She's a bitch. That's what you mean. Uh, she thinks she's too good for the rest of us. 
Ivy punches the silver button on the hand dryer and holds the, up my shirt. I reread the, the graffiti. I love Derek. Mr. Night Neck Bites. I hate this place. Sarah Cruz rocks. Sarah Cruz sucks. List of hotties and list of jerks, list of ski resorts in Colorado everyone dreams about. Phone numbers that have been scratched out with keys. Entire conversation scroll down the bathroom stall. It's like a community chat room, a metal uh, newspaper. I asked Ivy to hand over one of her pens. She does. I think you're going to have to bleach this thing, she says, and hands me the shirt over as well. And I pull it over my head, still damp. What did you want the marker for? I hold the cap through my teeth and I start another subject uh, thread on the wall. Guys to stay away from. The, in the first entry is the beast himself, Andy Evans. I swing the door open with a flourish. Ta-da! I point to my handiwork. Ivy grins. The climax of mating season is nearly upon us, the senior prom. They should cancel school this week. The only things we're learning is who is going with who. Who? Must ask your woman. Who asked, who bought a dress from Manhattan, which limo company won't take you if you drink, the most expensive tux place, and on and on and on. The gossip energy alone could power the, the uh, building's electricity for the rest of the marking period. The teachers are pissed. Kids are handing in homework because they have appointments at the tanning salon. Um, Andy B asks Rachel to go with him. I can't believe her mother is letting her go. And maybe she agreed because they're going on a double date with Rachel's brother and his date. Rachel's one of those rare ninth graders invited to the senior prom. Her social stock has roared. She must not have gotten my note. Or maybe she decided to ignore it. Maybe she showed it to Andy and they had a good laugh. Maybe she won't get into trouble like, maybe she won't get in the trouble like I did. Maybe he'll listen to her. Maybe I had to stop thinking about it before I go nuts. Heather had belly crawling for help, has come belly crawling for help. My mother can't believe it. A living, breathing friend on the front porch of my maladjusted daughter. I pry Heather out of my mother's claws and we retreat to my room. My stuffed rabbits crawl out of their burrows, nose a-wiggling, pink bunnies, purple bunnies, a gingham bunny for my grandma. They were as excited as my mother. Company! I can see the room through Heather's green-tinted contacts. She doesn't say anything, but I know she thinks it looks stupid. A baby room. All of those toy rabbits, there must be a hundred of them. My mom knocks on the door. She has cookies for us. I want to ask if she's feeling sick. I hand the bag to Heather. She takes one cookie and nibbles at its edge. I scarf five just to spite her. I lie on my head, trapping the bunnies next to the wall. Heather delicately pushes a pile of dirty clothes off the chair and perches her skinny butt on it. I wait. She launches into a sob story about how much she hates being a Martha drone. Indentured servitude would be better. They aren't just taking advantage of her, or they're just taking advantage of her, bossing her around. Her grades are all the way down to B's because of the time she has to spend on the senior Martha's. Her father is thinking about taking a job in Dallas, and she wouldn't mind moving again, not one bit, because she heard kids in the South aren't as stuck up as here. I ate more cookies. I'm finding the shock of having a guest in my room. I almost kick her out because it's going to hurt too much when my room is empty again. Um, Ma, Heather says, I was smart, so smart, Mel, to blow off this stupid group. The whole year has been horrible. I hate it every single day, and I didn't have the guts to get out like you did. She completely ignores the fact that I was never in, and that she dumped me, banished me from even the shadows of Martha Glory. I feel like any minute, a guy in a lavender suit will burst into the room with a microphone and bellow, another alternate reality moment brought to you by adolescence. I can't figure out, wh out why she's here. She licks a crumb off, the cookie, off her cookie and gets to the point. She and another junior Martha are required to decorate the Route 11 um, Holiday Inn ballroom for prom. Meg and Emily and Savon can't exist, of course. They have to get their nails painted and their teeth whitened. The privileged, the few, the junior Marthas have been laid waste of monocolosis and leaving Heather um, all by herself. She is desperate. You have to decorate the whole thing by Saturday night. Actually, we can't start until 3 Saturday afternoon because of some student meeting of the Chrysler salesman. But I know we can do it. I'm asking other kids, too. Do you know anyone who could help? Frankly, no, I don't. But I chew and try to look thoughtful. Heather takes this to mean yes, and I'd be happy to help her. She bounces off the chair. I knew you would help. You're great. Tell you what, I owe you. I owe you a big one. 
How about next week I come over and help you redecorate me? Didn't you tell me about, tell me once how much you hated your room? Well, now I see why. It can be so depressing just to wake up every morning. We'll clean out all this junk. She kicks a Chanel bunny who was sleeping in my robe on the floor. And get rid of those curtains. <clears throat> Maybe you can go shopping with me. I can get your mom's American Express. She yanks the curtains to one side. Let's not forget to wash the windows. Seafoam, uh, seafoam green and sage. That's what we should look for. Classic and feminine. No. You want something richer like eggplant or cobalt? No, I haven't decided on colors yet. And that's not what I mean. I mean, no, I won't help you. She collapses into the chair again. You have to help me. No, I don't. But why? I bite my lip. She doesn't want to know the truth, that she's self-centered and cold, that I hope that all the seniors yell at her, that I hate seafoam green, and besides, it's none of her business if my windows are dirty. I feel dirty button noses against my back. Bunnies say, be kind, lie. I have plans. The tree guy is coming to work on the oak in the out front, and I have to dig in the garden. Besides, I know what I want to do in here, and it doesn't include eggplant. Most of it's half true, half planned. Heather scolds and opens the dirty window to let in fresh air. It brushes my hair off of my, um, it, it brushes my hair back off of my face. I tell Heather she has to leave. I need to clean. She crams a cookie in her mouth and doesn't say goodbye to my mother. What a snot. I'm on a roll. I'm rocking. I don't know what it is. Standing up to Heather, planting my marigold seeds, or maybe the look on my mom's face when I asked if she would let me redecorate my room. The time has come to arm wrestle some demons. Too much sun after Sarah Cruz wind does strange things to your head. It makes you feel strange, even if you aren't. I must talk to Rachel. I can't do it in algebra. The beast waits for her outside English. But... Um, we have study hall at the same time. Bingo. I'll find her squinting at, at a book with the small type in the library. She's too vain for glasses. I instruct my heart not to bolt down the hallway and sit next to her. No nuclear bombs detonate. A good start. As she looks at me without expression, and I try, uh, I try on a smile, size medium. Hi. Or hey, I say. Hmm. She responds. No lip curling. No rude hand gestures. So far, so good. I look at the book she's copying word for word from. It's about France. Homework? Kind of. She taps her pencil on the table. I'm going to France this summer with the International Club. We have to do a report to prove we're serious. That's great. I mean, you talked about, uh, you've always talked about traveling ever since we were kids. Remember when we were in the fourth grade and we read Heidi and we tried melting cheese in your fireplace? We laughed a little too loudly. It's not really that funny, but we're both nervous. The librarian points to her finger at uh, his finger at us. Bad students, bad, bad students. No laughing. I look at her notes. They are lousy. A few facts about Paris, decorated by Eiffel Tower, doodle hearts, and initials R, B, and I, um, A, I, Gap. So you're really going out with him? With Andy? I heard about prom. Rachel grins honey slow. She stretches like the mention of his name wakes her muscles and makes her tummy jump. He's great, she says. He's just so awesome and gorgeous and yummy. She stops. She is talking to the village lover. What are you going to do when he goes to college? Are going to arrow through her soft spot. Clouds across the sun. I can't think about that. It hurts too much. He said he was going to let his parents... He was going... He said he was going to get his parents to let him transfer back here. He could go to La Salle or, or Sierra Cruz, and I'll wait for him. Give me a break. You've been going out for, what, like two weeks, three? A cold front blows across the library. She straightens up and snaps shut the cover of her notebook. What do you want, anyway? Before I can answer, the librarian pounces. We are welcome to continue our conversation in the principal's office, or we can stay and be quiet. Our choice... I take my out my notebook and write to Rachel. It's nice to talk to you again. I'm sorry we couldn't be friends this year. I pass the notebook to her. She melts a bit around the edges and writes back. Yeah, I know. So who do you like? No one really. My lab partner is kind of nice, but like a friend friend, not a boyfriend or anything. Rachel nods wisely. She's staying in a senior. She is beyond these freshman friend friend relationships. She's in charge again. Time for me to suck up. Are you still mad at me? I write. 
she doodles a quick lightning bolt. No, I guess not. It was a long time ago. She stops and draws a spiraling circle. I stand on the edge and wonder if I'm going to fall in. That party was a little wild, she continues, but it was dumb to call the cops. We should have just left. She slides the notebook over to me. I draw a spiraling circle on the opposite direction to Rachel's. I could leave it like this and stop in the middle of the highway. She's talking to me again. All I have to do is keep the dirt hidden and walk arm in arm with her into the sunset. She reaches back to fix her scrunchie. R-B-A-I-A-E is written in red pen on the inside of her forearm. Breathe in, one, two, three. Breathe out, one, two, three. I force my hands to relax. I didn't call the cops to break up the party, I write. I called, I put the pencil down. I picked it up again. Them, it's because some guy raped me under the trees and I didn't know what to do. She watches as I carve out the words. She leans closer to me. I write more. I was stupid and drunk and I didn't know what was happening. And then he hurt, I scribbled that out, raped me. When the police came, everyone was screaming and I was too scared. So I cut through some backyards and walked home. I push the notebook back to her. She stares at the word. She pulls her chair around to the side of the table. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, she writes. Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't tell anybody. Does your mom know? I shook my head and tears prop from some hidden spring. Damn. I sniff and wipe my eyes on my sleeve. Eyes on my sleeve. Did you get pregnant? Did you, did you have a disease? Oh my God, are you okay? No, I don't think so. Yes, I'm okay. Well, kind of. Rachel writes in a heavy, fast hand, who did it? I turn the page. Andy Evans. Liar! She stumbles out of her chair and grabs her book off the table. I can't believe you. You're jealous. You're a twisted little freak. You're jealous and I'm popular and I'm going to prom. And so you lied to me like this? You sent me a note? Didn't you? You were so sick. She spins up. She spins to take on the librarian. I'm going to the nurse, she states. I think I'm going to throw. I'm standing in the lobby looking at the looking at the buses. I don't want to go home. I want to stay here. I got my hopes up halfway through the conversation with Rachel. That was my mistake. I was like smelling a perfect Christmas feast and having the door slammed in your face, leaving you alone in the cold. Melinda, I hear my name. Great. Now I'm hearing things. Maybe I should have asked the guidance counselor for a therapist or, or a nosy shrink. I can't say anything. I feel awful. I tell somebody I feel worse. I have... I'm, I'm having trouble finding a middle ground. Someone touches my arm gently. Linda, it's Ivy. Can you take the late, can you take the late bus? I want to show you something. We walk together and she leads me to the bathroom. The one where she washed my shirt, which by the way, still has traces of markers, even after bleach. She points to the stall. Take a look. Guys to stay away from. Andy Evans. He's a creep. He's a bastard. Stay away. He should be locked up. He thinks he's all that. Call the cops. What's the name of that drug you give to perverts so they can't give them up? Uh, Dipper Proper something. <laughs> he should get it every morning in his orange juice. I went out with him to the movies and he tried to get my hands on the pants during the previews. There's more different pens, different handwritings, conversations between some writers, arrows into the longer paragraphs. It's better than taking out a billboard. I think I can fly. I wake up the next morning, Saturday, to the sound of a chainsaw, the noise biting through my ears and splintering my plans of sleeping in. I peer out the window, the arborist, the tree guys dad called in to trim the oak dead branches stand at the base of the tree. One guy revving up the chainsaw like it's on, uh, like it's a sports car and the other giving the tree the once over. I go downstairs for breakfast. Watching cartoons is out of the question. I make a cup of tea and join dad and a group of neighborhood kids watching the show from the driveway. One arborist monkeys his way into the pale green canopy, then hauls up the chainsaw turned off at the um, end of a thick rope. He sets to work, pruning the dead wood like a sculptor. Brrr, the chainsaw gnaws through the oak and branches and crashing to the ground. The air swirls with sawdust. Sap oozes from the open sores of the trunk. He's killing the tree. He'll only leave a stump. The tree's dying. There's nothing to do or say. We watch in silence as the tree crashes piece by piece to the damp ground. The chainsaw murderer swings down with a grin. He doesn't even care. A little kid asks my father why that man is chopping down the tree. He 
he's not chopping it down, he's saving it. Those branches were long, were long dead from disease. All plants are like that. By cutting off the damage, you make it possible for the tree to grow again. You watch, by the end of the summer, this tree will be the strongest on the block. I hate when my father pretends to know more than he does. He sells insurance. He's not a forest ranger, lies in the way of the woods. An arborist fires up the mulcher at the back of their truck. And I see enough. I grab my bike and take off. The first stood, the first stop is in the gas station. I pump up my tires and I can't remember the last time I rode. The morning is warm, a lazy, slow Saturday. The parking lot at the grocery store is full. A couple of softball games are being played behind the elementary school, but I don't stop to watch. I ride up the hill past Rachel's house, past the high school. The, uh, the downside is a fast, easy coast. I dare myself to lift my hand off the handlebars. As long as I'm moving fast enough, the front wheels hold steady. I turn left and left again, following the hills down without realizing where I'm heading. Some part of me has planned this, a devious internal compass pointed me to the past. The lane isn't familiar until I glimpse the barn. Until I glimpse the barn. I squeeze the brakes hard and struggle to control the bike over the gravel shoulder. The wind rips through the phone wires overhead. A squirrel fights to retain her balance. There are no cars in the driveway. Rogers is painted on the mailbox. A basketball hoop hangs off the side of the barn. I don't remember that, but it, but it would have been hard to see in the dark. I walk my bike along the bike's edge of the property where the trees swallow the sun. The bike leans into the, cla the clasping fence. I sink into the, the shade cold ground. My heart thuds as if we were still pedaling, if it's still as if I were pedaling uphill. My hands shake. It is a completely normal place out of sight of the barn and house, close enough to the road that I can hear cars passing. Fragments of acorn shells litter the ground. You could bring a kindergartner here, class here for a picnic. I think about lying down. No, that would not do it. That would not do. I crouch by the trunk, my fingers stroking the bark, seeing the braille code, a clue, a message on how to come back to life after my long under so dormancy. I have survived. I am here, confused, screw up, but here. So how can I find my way? Is there a chainsaw of the soul, an ax I can take for my memories or fingers? I dig my fingers into the dirt and squeeze. A small, clean part of, my, of me waits to warm and burst through the surface. Some quiet Melinda girl I haven't seen in months. And that, that is the seed I will care for. When I get home, it's time for lunch. I make two egg salad sandwiches and drink an enormous glass of milk. I eat an apple and put my dishes in the dishwasher. So only it's only one o'clock. I suppose I should clean the kitchen and vacuum, but the windows are open and the robins are singing on the front lawn where a pile of mulch with my name is wait, on it is waiting. Mom is impressed when she drives up for dinner time. The front yard is raked and edged and mowed and the bushes are mulched. I'm not even breathing hard. Mom helps me carry the plastic deck furniture up, up from the basement and I scrub it with bleach. Dad brings home pizza, uh, home pizza and we eat it on the deck. Dad and mom drink iced tea and there's no biting or snarling. I clear the dishes and throw the pizza box in the trash. I lie down on the couch to watch TV but my eyes close and I'm out. When I wake up, it's past midnight and someone has covered me with an afghan. The house is quiet and dark cool breeze slides in between the curtains. I'm wide awake. I feel itchy inside my skin, antsy. That's what my mom, mo what my mother would call it. I can't sit still. I have to do something. My bike is still leaning against the prune tree in the front yard. I ride up and down across and diagonal. I pedal my shore legs through the streets of the suburb, mostly sleeping. Some late night TV flickers from the bedroom windows. A few cars are parked in front of the grocery store. I imagine people mopping floors and restacking loaves of bread. I coast by the houses of people I used to know, Heather and Nicole, and turn the corner downshift and pedal harder up the hill to Rachel's house. The lights are on and her parents are waiting for the fairy prom goers to come home. I could knock on the door and ask them if they wanna play cards or something. No. I ride like I have wings. I'm not tired. I don't think I've, I'll ever sleep again. But Monday morning, the prom is legend. The drama, the tears, the passion. 
Why hasn't anyone made a television show out of this yet? The total damage included one stomach pump, three breakups of long-term relationships, one lost diamond earring, four outrageous hotel room parties, and five matching tattoos, allegedly decorating the behinds of the senior class officers. The guidance counselors are celebrating the lack of fatal accidents. Heather's not at school today. Everyone is griping about her lame decorations. I bet she calls in sick for the rest of the year. Heather should run away and join the Marines already. They'll be much sweeter to her than a swarm of angry Marthas. Heather is in her glory. She does Andy in the middle of prom. I'm trying to piece the story together from the grapevine gossip. They say she and Andy argued during a slow song. They say he was all over her with, with his hands and his mouth. While they danced, he was grinding against her and she backed off. The song ended and she swore at him. They say she was ready to slap him, but she didn't. He looked around all innocent-like, and she stomped over to her exchange student buddies, ended up dancing the night away with some kid from Portugal. They say Andy's been really pissy off, of, really pissed off ever since. He got wicked drunk at the party and passed out in a bowl of bean dip. Rachel burned everything he had, give, he had gave her and left the ashes in front of his locker. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> His friend laughed. <laughs> Except for the gossip, there's no real point in coming to school. Well, there are the final exams, and it's not like they're going to make any difference to my grades. We have, what, two more weeks of classes? Sometimes I think high school is one long hazing activity. If you're tough enough to survive this, they'll let you become an adult. I hope it's worth it. I'm waiting for the clock to end my daily torture by algebra session when wa-woom. I thought slams into my head. I don't want to hang on to my hidey hole anymore. I look behind me, half expecting to see this sniggering back row guy who beamed me with an eraser. Nope, the back row is struggling to stay awake. It was definitely an idea that hit me. I don't feel like hiding anymore. A breeze from that open window blows my hair back and tickles my shoulders. This is the first day warm enough for a sleeveless shirt. Feels like summer. After a class, I trail behind Rachel. Andy is waiting for her. She won't even look at him. The kid from Portugal is now Rachel's numero uno. Ha! Double ha! Serves you right, you scum. Kids stare at Andy, but somebody stops to talk. He follows Greta Ingrid and Rachel down the hall. I'm a few steps behind him. Greta Ingrid spins around and tells Andy exactly what he should do to himself. Impressive. Her language skills have really improved this year. I'm ready to do a victory dance. I head for my closet after school. I want to take the poster of Maya Angelou home, and I'd like to keep some of my tree pictures and my turkey bone sculpture. The rest of the stuff can stay, as long as it doesn't have my name on it. Who knows? Some other kids might, might need a safe place to run to for the next year. I haven't been able to get rid of the smell. I leave the door cracked open for a bit so I can breathe. It's hard to get the picture, my tree pictures, the tree pictures off the walls without tearing them. The day is getting hotter and there's no circulation in here. I open the door wider. Who's going to come by now? By this point in the year, teachers take off faster than students when the final bell rings. The only people left are a few teams scattered on the practice fields. I don't know what to do with the comforter. It's really too ratty to take home. I should have gone to my locker first and got my backpack. I first, I forgot about the books that are in her. I fold the comforter and set it on the floor and turn out the light and head out the door for my locker. Somebody slams into my chest and knocks me back into the closet. The light flicks on and the door closes. I'm trapped with Andy Evans. He stares at me without talking. He's not as tall as my memories, but is still loathsome. The, eyeball, the light bulb throws shadows over his eyes. He's made out with slabs of stone and gives off a smell that makes me afraid I want my pants. He cracks his knuckles. His hands are enormous. Andy Beast, you have a big mouth, you know it. Rachel blew me off at prom, giving me some bullshit about how I raped you. You know, that's a lie. I never raped anybody. I don't have to. You wanted it as bad as I did, but your feelings got hurt and you started spreading lies. Now every girl in the school is talking about me like I'm some kind of pervert. You've been spreading that bullshit story for weeks. What's wrong, ugly? You jealous? Can't get a date? The words fall like nails on the floor, hard and pointed. I try to walk around him. He blocks me away. Oh no, you're not going anywhere. You really screwed things up for me. He reaches behind me and locks the door. Clicks. Me. 
You're one strange bitch, know that? A freak. I can't believe anyone listened to you. He grabs my wrist. I try to pull them back, and he squeezes so tight it feels like my bones are splintering. He pins me against the closed door. Maya Angelou looks at me. She tells me to make some noise. I open my mouth and take a deep breath. Beast, you're not going to scream. You didn't scream before. You liked it. You're jealous that I took out your friend and not you. I think I know what you want. His mouth is on my face. I twist my head. His lips are wet and his teeth knock against my cheekbone. I pull my arms again and he slams his body against mine. I have no legs. My heart wobbles. My teeth are on his teeth are on my neck. The only sound I can make is a whimper. He fumbles to hold my wrist in one hand. He wants a he wants a free hand. I remember, I remember. Metal hands, not knife hands. No. The sound explodes for me. No. I follow the sound, pushing off the wall and pushing Andy Evans off balance, stumbling into the broken sink. He curses and, and turns, his fist coming and coming, an explosion in my, in my head and blood from my mouth. He hit me. I scream and scream. Why aren't the walls falling? I'm screaming loud enough to make the whole school crumble. I grab for anything, my potpourri bowl, and I throw it out and it bounces uh, to the floor. My books, he swears again. The door is locked. The door is locked. He grabs me and pulls me away from the door, one hand over my mouth, one hand around my throat. He leans me against the sink. My fists mean nothing to him. Little Robert Paul's thumping harmlessly. His body crushes me. My fingers wave overhead, looking for a branch, a limb, something to hang on to, a block of wood, a base of a turkey bone sculpture. I slam it against Maya's poster. I hear a crunch. It doesn't hear. It breathes like a dragon. Its hands lean, uh, leaves my throat, attacks my body. And it, I hit the wood against the poster and the mirror under it. Again, shards of glass slip down the wall and into the sink. It pulls away from me, puzzled. I reach in and wrap my hands around the triangle glass and I hold it to a Andy Evans' neck. He freezes. I push just hard enough to raise one drop of blood and he raises his hand over his head. My hand quivers. I want to insert the glass all the way through his throat. I want to hear him scream. I look up and see the stubble on his chin, a fleck of white at the corner of his mouth. His lips are paralyzed. He cannot speak. That's good enough. Me. I said no. He nods. Someone is pounding on the door. I locked it. The door swings open. Nicole is there, along with the lacrosse stream. Sweaty, angry, their sticks held high. Someone peels off and runs for help. Mr. Freeman is refusing to hand out his grades on time. They shouldn't have been in, or they should have been in four days before the end of school. But he didn't see the sense in that. So I'm staying after school on the very, very last day for one last try at getting my tree right. Mr. Freeman is covering the grade wall with a mural. He hasn't touched the line with, uh, with my name, but he eliminated everything else with a roller brush fast drying white paint. He hums as he mixes the colors on his palette. He wants to paint a sunrise. Summer vacation voices bubble through the open window. School is nearly over. The halls echo with slamming lockers and shrieks of, I'm gonna miss you, got my number. I turn up the radio. My tree is definitely breathing. Little shallow breaths like it just shot through the ground this morning. This one is not perfectly symmetrical. The bark is rough. I try to make it look as if initials have been carved in it in a long time ago. One of the lower branches is sick, but the tree really lives someplace. That branch better drop soon, so it doesn't kill the whole thing. Root knobs out of the ground, and the crown reaches for the sun, tall and healthy. The new growth is the best part. Lilac flows from the open window with a few lazy bees. I carve, and Mr. Freeman mixes orange and red to get the right shade of sunrise. Tires squeal out of the parking lot. Another sober student farewell. I'm staring, I'm staring summer school in the face, so there's really no hurry. I want to finish this tree. A couple of seniors stroll in and Mr. Freeman hugs them carefully, either because of the paint on him or because teachers hugging students can make for a bit trouble. I shake my bangs down in front of my face and watch through my hair. The, uh, they chat about New York City where the girls are going to college. Mr. Freeman writes down some phone numbers and the names of some restaurants. He says he has plenty of friends in Manhattan and that they should meet for brunch some Sunday. The girls, the women, hop up and down and squeal, I can't believe it's really happening. One of them is Amber Cheerleader. Go figure. 
The seniors look my way before they leave. One girl, not a cheerleader, nods her head and says, way to go. I hope you're okay. With hours left in school, with, in the school year, I have suddenly become popular. Thanks to the big mouths on the lacrosse team, everybody know what's happened, happened before sundown. Mom took me to the hospital to stitch up my, my hand. When I got home, there was a message on the machine from Rachel. She wants me to call her. My tree needs something. I walk over to the desk and need a piece of brown paper and a finger and a finger of chalk. Mr. Freeman talks about the art galleries and I practice birds, little dashes of color on paper. It's awkward with the bandage on my hand, but I keep trying. I draw them without thinking, fight, flight, flight, feather wing. Water drips on the paper and the, and the birds bloom in the light, their feathers expanding promise. It happened. There's no avoiding it, no forgetting, no running away or flying or bearing or hiding. Andy Evans raped me in August when I was drunk and too young to know what was happening. It wasn't my fault. He hurt me. It wasn't my fault. And I'm not going to let it kill me. I can grow. I look at my homely sketch. It doesn't need anything. Even through the river in my eyes, I can see that. It isn't perfect. And that makes it just right. The last bell rings and Mr. Freeman comes to my table. Mr. Freeman, time's up, Melinda. Are you ready? I hand over my picture and take it in the, he takes it in his hands and studies it. I sniff again and wipe my eyes on my arms. The bruises are vivid, but they will fade. Mr. Freeman, no crying in my studio. It ruins the supplies. Salt, you know, saline. Etches like acid. He sits on the stool next to me and hands me back my tree. You'll get an A+. You've worked hard at this. He hands me a box of tissues. You've been through a lot, haven't you? The tears dissolve the last block of ice in my throat. I feel the frozen stillness melt down through inside of me, sh dripping shards of ice that vanish in a puddle of sunlight on the stained floor. Words float up. Me. Let me tell you about it.